This is Kirk Marple. This is The Service Design Show, episode 209. AI, it's the buzzword of the moment. But let's go beyond the hype and get into the nitty gritty of how it can actually be applied to our work as service design professionals. Today's guest is a software engineer who's building a tool that I think has the potential to radically change the game for us. Get ready to geek out with me. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push our businesses forward, and honor our planet. Our guest today, Kirk Marple, worked many years at Microsoft, where he led teams building software that was used by millions of people. But he's not your typical tech guy. In his younger years, he was a college DJ with a passion for indie and alternative music. And his proudest accomplishment isn't just about lines of code or technical achievements. It's about the impact his software had on the real world. Get this. He wrote software that was used in every public broadcasting station across the USA. Today, Kirk is the CEO of Graphlet, a tool that leverages AI to make knowledge accessible and useful for everyone using a technology called Retrieval Augmented Generation, also known as RAG. My personal experience with RAG has shown that it can be extremely helpful in many stages of the service design process. This is the future, people, and it's happening right now. So in today's episode, you are going to learn about how AI can actually understand your work, not just general knowledge. We'll cover how to turn your scattered notes and qualitative research data into a powerful tool, how to ask your data direct questions and get real answers, and how anyone, not just tech experts, can use this form of AI to their advantage. We'll even tackle the tricky bits like privacy and making sure your AI is giving you good info, not just random garbage. One thing that really stuck with me from the chat with Kirk was the idea that using AI is more of an art than a science. We dive into what that means for us as a design community and how to embrace the ambiguity that comes with working with this new technology. Whether you're already an avid user or just dipping your toes into the world of AI, this conversation offers a fresh perspective on how to harness the power of this new technology to elevate your work and unlock new possibilities. So join me for an inspiring conversation with Kirk Marple, and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. And welcome to the show, Kirk. Hi, thanks. Happy to be here. I'm um, excited about our conversation. This is going to be a different conversation than we I usually have here on the show. Uh, we were already geeking out a little bit in our prep uh, talk. You uh, told me that you are a software engineer at heart still. Uh, my background mm -hmm. is also software engineering more than 20 years ago uh, before I joined the service design army. Um, I uh, uh, titled this episode for myself as opening the AI black box. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. super interesting um, to talk about AI in the application of AI and actually un unpacking it a little bit because Everybody knows ChatGPT. Everybody is talking about AI, but like, let's let's go beyond the abstract term and and dive into the specifics uh, a bit more. I invited you because I actually had a very specific use case um, mm -hmm. that got me curious and that me got me exploring the world of AI. Um, we'll talk about the use case in uh, a second, and I stumbled upon the service uh, that you're mm -hmm. building. And I was like, more people need to know about this. So <laughs> that's a long intro uh, to uh, invite you to maybe share a little bit about what you do and what does Graphlet do? Yeah, thanks. I mean, we have really are all about 
kind of enabling knowledge for software developers. So it's knowledge embedded in, in media, in documents, um, in Slack messages, really any kind of what we call unstructured data and make it easy for, for devs like ourselves to really I mean, integrate it into, into our application. So that's what Graphlet is. It's an API first platform that I've been working on for the last several years. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it really I mean ties AI to the, the data that we all kind of collect and, and work with. Nice. So. Um, we need to get specific. And everybody who's interested to mm -hmm. learn more, the links will be in the show notes. Um, what, how would you describe the the problem that Graphlet is solving? And that maybe uh, we'll talk about this more in depth, but retrieval augmented generation is solving. Mm -hmm. Rack. Yeah, I mean, if, if you really think about, I don't know, I, even I go back to... Um, tools that we all have used for collecting media like iPhoto or um, things like that. And it really starts with, I mean, how do you find things? I mean, how do you really find data? Um, and it could be for personal use, it could be for business use. And I mean, a lot of times we do things like, I mean, with organizing that knowledge um, with like tagging. And I mean, we put things in folders or we tag content. And what AI really can, can let you do is kind of auto-organize that data and that lets you retrieve it. And so that's really what we've been, I mean, we kind of started in this world of, of trying to build a catalog for this kind of data, but using kind of natural language um, processing or computer vision to automatically do it because um, companies had 20 years of data and they just couldn't do it manually um, or they just had like all these different file types. And so what I mean, we're really interested in is kind of how do you organize it? And that's really how you then retrieve it is, I mean, if you have good, um, a good organization on data, then you can do this kind of R and retrieval in what's called RAG. And what you get out of RAG is essentially what people experience with ChatGPT. And so it's, you have source data that you're kind of feeding into this, this sort of fire hose of data that you, that comes from, um, from all these different sources and these large language models have to process it and give you answer, your answer back to your prompt. But there's all kinds of techniques in how to get it to give a good response. And folks have probably heard of like hallucinations of where it gives back kind of like a fake response or it's guessing. And that's really a lot of what we're trying to do is, is uh, kind of avoid, avoid those problems. Yeah, we'll talk about the difference to a sort of vanilla chat GPT to the generic chat mm -hmm. GPT in a second. And I think it's good to sort of explain now what my use case was that got me going down this rabbit hole of retrieval augmented generation, uh, graphs. So I was um, in the Circle community, which I run. Uh, we host, let's call them workshop or sessions, group discussions. And right now we have... I think close to 70 conversations recorded. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of knowledge locked in those conversations. And the way we unlock that knowledge right now is in your uh, classic way of transcribing our recordings and then using plain old search to search for the specific keywords. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue I was running into and that the members of my community were running into is when we're talking, for instance, about change management or getting buy-in or whatever term you want to focus on, if you do search like this, then those words need to be explicitly stated by someone in order to mm -hmm. find them. Uh, this is this is classic search. And then it sort of dawned on me, like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually have a conversation with sort of our library of recordings. And I was mm -hmm. literally imagining going to a library, having a librarian sitting in front of you and you mm -hmm. asking them a question like, I want to access all the sessions, all the recordings that relate to change management. And this librarian would be able to point you to all those different like, books or recordings that would have this. And this librarian would was for me like this is the promise of AI. Like this is able to translate what you're doing, and um, then I started to look into like okay, how do we get these our data into AI? Because Chat GPT 
doesn't know about what we have discussed right. in the workshop. So this is like sort of the context. And when I share this with you, is this like a stereotypical example of what you encounter? Yeah, and it's it's really similar to kind of my original idea that drove this. I mean, five, six years ago, I was thinking about a podcast discovery platform. Like I listened to a lot of podcasts, I was commuting, and I kept thinking there's so much knowledge and information embedded that I'm it's sort of I felt like it was like dropping on the floor. Like I could absorb only so much of it. And I was like, well, how do I explore this data? Like there's I mean, it's not just about the memory side of it, but it's, I mean, the relationships, like you said, this, this episode has a piece that relates to this episode or this topic. And it may be not even just the podcast, but it's, I mean, there's papers, there's articles, blogs. And it, once you start thinking about that, it just expands out of like this web of information. I mean, like the web, the internet, um, and it, it's, it really kind of goes back to the heart of, I mean, what people used to call the semantic web of it's really about not just links between pages, it's it's the relationships between the knowledge. And, and it's really the core of what's really drives me of, I, it's such an untapped problem that, I mean, it's, and it's not just about organizing the data, but it's coming up with unique ways to consume the data as well and, and make it useful to us. So when you um, mention unique ways to consume, the data, what does that mean? Um, I mean, I kind of always look at like chat being one way of consuming. I mean, it's a text interface that, I mean, you're giving a single, I mean, sentence or paragraph to the model, to AI, and you're getting back a par couple paragraphs back. But that's just kind of one, um, I mean, sort of one pattern of, of consumption. And I saw a great tweet today where somebody's saying, we're kind of in like the MS-DOS, like, terminal of, of AI right now, and we're still thinking about inventing windows. And so it's really about, I mean, we're, we're just scratching the surface on how to leverage AI with, um, with I mean, how we, like voice is one way, I mean, chat is one way, but I really think there's going to be, I mean, so many other ways of consuming this knowledge um, through things like agents and other, other methods that, I mean, we're, we're, well, most of the fun stuff is really ahead of us. Yeah, uh, agents, also something we'll address uh, later uh, in this conversation. To, uh, to sort of give a few more examples of use cases, how this might be relevant to service design professionals, I was thinking about um, how could this be relevant? So in our work, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of qualitative data, a lot of mm -hmm. conversations, uh, interviews between um, uh, user research or we do uh, these days a lot of online workshops and you have a lot of uh, uh, images, uh, whether it's mm -hmm. diagrams or uh, mirror boards with sticky notes. Um, the awesome thing about this is that this whole idea of retrieval augmented generation allows you to feed your data into mm -hmm. a large language model and then query the data. So especially, at least from my perspective, for people who are working with tons of qualitative data that is uh, that, that are not spreadsheets or not databases, yeah. um, this, this opens up so many opportunities to actually start, start working with large, large volumes of qualitative data and uh, being able to uh, make that much more easily accessible. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, and I think that's where it really gets interesting of retrieval is not just one step. It's typically not, hey, I search for something, I get a result, and I'm done. And, and I think that's where we'll start to see these kind of multi-step processes where it's like, okay, maybe I do a search or a filter and I get a set of data, like a couple of documents, a couple of web pages. But then what I can do is I could feed, maybe there's images embedded in those documents or diagrams on those web pages, but then I can take those and feed those to the multimodal models for understanding and do a next level of um, of asking maybe different questions, or maybe I'm, I'm now creating descriptions of those. And so it's kind of this tiered approach where, I, I mean, the classic needle in a haystack, like you're trying to make the haystack a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller until you have just the core amount of data, but then the prompt is kind of like the needle <laughs> or the, mm -hmm. the answer to the prompt is kind of the needle. Um, and I think that's where it gets really interesting because it's, ChatGPT is kind of almost just linear 
but it's really about taking a massive data set and start to wind it down um, into, into something you can really manage and deal with. And um, we've seen some of these examples, like the classic example that you see with uh, large language models, whether it's ChatGPT or mm -hmm. Gemini, is that they draw a, a logic flow, a flow model of a software program. They make an image of that, upload it, and then ask the large language model to actually code that, right? That's yeah. um, th there's no, re well, th there's interpretation going on there. But uh, again, now uh, going back to the service design world, imagine doing a workshop with a lot of people and you have a lot of sticky notes and relationships floating around. People have drawn stuff. You can now actually put this into, you can store this, you can make this mm -hmm. searchable. And um I think the again the awesome thing for me is that you can start asking questions, uh, not whether or not like tell me um, what was on that sticky note, but you can say what were the top three questions discussed in mm -hmm. that session. That is uh, a a question that's on a higher level of understanding, right? Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's where retrieval gets interesting. So, I mean, the the sort of hello world of of RAG is, I mean, you're just giving giving a prompt. You're using a vector database to kind of find similarity of the text you gave it and getting results back. And so, but like you said, there's other ways to retrieve data. There's ways to look at the prompt you're giving, and maybe you're actually doing a query. You're saying, hey, I want to count something, or I want to. Um, I don't know, find um, some company or some place. And it may not just be text similarity. It may be like a bunch of different retrieval things happening in parallel, but then you accumulate that information at the end. And that's where I think it's, we're still, I mean, we're still scratching the surface of, of how people are retrieving data, but I think it's, there's gonna be a ton of innovation to, to just get better data to the models. So that's one of the questions that I had, like, the the classic example of garbage in garbage out yeah. um what are things um uh, like this i'm presenting this i as almost magic it feels magic to me but it's not yeah. and um you have to i'm sure get a lot of things right to actually get quality results uh from this mm -hmm. so when people are considering using a system like this what's the thing to be mindful of I think the thing people kind of don't maybe don't get in the in the first moment is it's like you said garbage in garbage out it's only as good as the data you're giving it unless you're asking a question of what the model was trained on so it's kind of like an encyclopedia like i mean the model is like an encyclopedia you maybe can find the page find the information on it but if you're asking a question that is in a different language or isn't even in the book it's going to have no way to answer that. And so it's you essentially have to give it the, the details, like go find the research materials, like you're the librarian, and, and basically lay it out on the table and let the language model pour through all that information and give you an answer. And I think that's where there's this chat GPT looks like magic uh, because you can ask questions of what it was trained on. But if it's something that isn't in there, you have to basically give it to it. I mean, and that's that's the part of the, the retrieval that's so important. How do you see um, people, organizations implementing this? So I can imagine, like, I'm a small team. I know mm -hmm. what I'm putting into the system. I know what the source data is. But now we're working with uh, distributed teams. Uh, Everybody is mm -hmm. adding stuff to our library. Um, but mm -hmm. how do we, how do you, at some point, like, how do we even track what's been added? I mean, that's what we we kind of call it. I mean, part of that is is data lineage. I mean, where where did this data get sourced from? I mean, did it come from Slack? Is it from? Is it in this folder? Who? What person is it from? Um, I had this idea a few years ago of, of like index everything in time and space. I mean, know where it was captured, when it was captured, and if you can have that metadata with the information you can do a lot, have a lot of value. I mean, it, you can ask it questions about, hey, like, where was this data, I mean, near something? Or when was this, I mean, recently? And so you have that. Um, and so it's always important to have that extra data, um, what we call metadata. 
And I think that that's part of the process of getting good retrieval is having that context of the sources that it came from. And, and that's really how you can understand kind of, I mean, the, the tracking of the lineage of it. Now, I realize that we haven't touched upon like what, what kind of data are we talking about? So we mentioned podcasts and we mentioned transcripts, we mentioned images, like, <clears throat> but what are, what are other sources of data? You mentioned uh, Slack messages and that got me thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's of course, like that, that, that's amazing. Like what, what can you ingest? What, what is there to ingest? It's, it's, I mean, kind of wild. Like when people a lot of times talk about, okay, what is unstructured data? And there's maybe as people thinking, ah, oh, well, I mean, it's not really unstructured and there's a structure to it. I kind of look at it as it's everything other than something that looks like Excel. I mean, mm -hmm. anything that's not just a row and a column. And, and so it's, it's easier to describe to me what it's not. And that can be a ton of different things. I mean, it can be web content. It can be, um, like for people in, in a product world or engineering world, it could be like a Jira ticket. And I mean, it's things that maybe aren't obvious that are have some form of textual content. Um, in my old world, in the broadcast world, it was, we called them, I mean, media assets. And it was, it was video, it was audio, it was closed captioning, um, like you said, imagery, uh, but also what we actually started working on first in the company was geospatial data as well. I mean, maps and layers and draw and CAD drawings and like building um, in what they call BIM files, like building systems. That that is all unstructured data as well, essentially. I can imagine that that also makes it super complicated for people to to start because you can like ingest anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a, again, a podcast is an easy example. Um, but once you start thinking, oh, so we can also feed our emails into this system mm -hmm. and we can also feed our invoices or like the like yeah. a, a analysis paralysis, right? And, and even a podcast, if you think about it, in, in the RSS feed that is a podcast, there's metadata. I mean, it has your episode number, it has your description, it has all this stuff in, and then there's probably a web link to your show notes. And so if you think of the, all those interconnected pieces just to one episode, I mean, there's a lot of data that can be adjusted. And, and then going back to keeping those connections valid, I mean, that's what's really important because you might see like you search for something and you're like, wait, was that in the transcript of the episode or was it in the show notes of the episode? Or was it in a, something that was linked to the show notes? You need to track all that. If we, uh, we're jumping from branch to branch here, but uh, if we go back to my use case and the circle community, yeah. one of the things we were talking about is um, the idea of filtering. So uh, I presented you sort of with the challenge or asked if this is possible, like, can we, for instance, ask the question, give me uh, uh, the top three of insights um, that were discussed in the sessions in the first quarter of 2021 and mm -hmm. uh, in the sessions that were presented by Mark. So we're adding this metadata of date. We're adding this metadata of um, a person. Uh, and you told me, yeah, that's absolutely doable, right? Yeah, and I think, I mean, what, what we're seeing is there's kind of this split of, and, and they call it prompt classification. Like when you have a user prompt, you have to know, is this a query about the data or of the data? And, and that's, that's really the big difference there of what you're asking is like, how many books in the library do I have? Like what, how many of the books in the library are read? And, and that's one type of question. And then another type of question is, how many books in the library are about dogs? And those are very different questions. And and the the question about dogs would be perfect for a vector search because you're looking for similar text, but that doesn't work at all for how many books are read and are on the third floor. And so that's one of the things where... Um, it's, I mean, I don't think that's obvious maybe to a lot of people because when we first implemented our system, we had people testing it and they were trying to ask that, like, how many podcast episodes do I have? And I'm like, you can't ask that. <laughs> like, it just, that's not possible. Like, that's not, that's not the way this stuff works right now. And I think that's where you really have to think of um, a system has to handle both sides to really do it well. 
You mentioned a vector search. I have a vague yeah. clue about that is. Uh, can you explain this in layman's term? What do you mean with vector search? I mean, the easiest way to look at it is, I mean, you have a chunk of text, say, call it a paragraph of text, and you create sort of a thumbnail for it. And I mean, it's it's like almost like you're going to create a zip file of it and you create a small, tiny little version of it that um, may not be unique. And it's probably going to be, I mean, something you could find similarity to in another paragraph of text. And so really all you're looking for is kind of these these thumbprints or these finger fingerprints of the text to be sort of similar to each other and maybe not exact. And what you do then is you pull together a cluster of things that kind of look fuzzily similar. And that is what they call top K um, retrieval. So you're asking for some number of things equal to K, which could be like 10 or 25. And that becomes the source for your conversation. And so that's, I mean, a very simplified version, but that's basically how it works. Yeah. So that that's the magic of, um, oh, I, I lost the technical term, uh, semantic semantic search, right? Yeah. Where you, can, yeah. where you can actually ask a question and you don't, you get retrieval based on understanding of the text. So you ask something about, I don't know, uh, the Netherlands and the large language model is able, or the vector search, the semantic search, is able to understand what you mean mm -hmm. with that question and retrieve paragraphs that have the same meaning, which is, again, it, it's pretty mind-blowing to think that that actually works, uh, but it does. But the, the downside of it also is it's if you're not giving it very much information, everything's similar to it. And and that's where the stuff breaks down. And so I Can think- Can you give an example? Yeah, I mean, even with what you just said in the Netherlands, I mean, if you're asking, I mean, um, I don't know, what's the um, what's the weather in the Netherlands? And you have 50 web pages that have the word weather on there and, or a reference to weather and a reference to the Netherlands. I mean, it's going to it's going to pick those up with some sense of probability like it may not be and every, this is all just relative to each other. And and that's where if you don't give very specific questions it can find a lot of relevance. Um, and so I think the other part is, I mean, if you have repetitive data in your content, like, I don't know, um, an example would be is like a footer on a web page that exists on every web page and has some text in it. If you put in a question, you're going to get a hit on every one of those web pages because it's going to find something similar. Um, and so that's where the stuff you have to be careful about how you pick and choose where where the stuff is found. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the quality of your library matters, right? The, yeah. the what, what you put in the library. I, I, I really like the idea and the metaphor of a library and thinking of a librarian who's able to do the yeah. uh, heavy yeah. lifting for you. Um, yeah, so it does matter what you put into the uh, library. You also referred to this, I think, as, a, as your corporate brain, right? Instead of a library. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's really, I mean, there's they, there's this concept of like a, your second brain that is, I mean, more of a personal kind of concept. But I mean, I think having that corporate brain or I've called it like domain knowledge and for, for businesses where it's their collective knowledge and we saw this, we were talking to a lot of people and they're like, look, I mean, when these people start retiring, there's going to be so much lost information that's in their kind of that corporate brain. Um, and I think this is where this stuff gets really important. I mean, if all these documents and all these, I mean, these articles and reports and things that exist in business, the people that work there might remember them, know where to find things. But when that librarian retires, the new librarian is not going to remember anything. Mm. And and I think that's we're going to see this transformation, and I, I mean AI can help with that immensely, is um, for training and onboarding people, and um, I mean really just kind of being that that help to um, for knowledge management business. So I'm on the side where I'm still in uh, in awe about what's possible mm -hmm. here. I'm seeing the possibilities, but let's um, uh, step over to sort of the devil's advocate side for a second. I can also imagine that. Um, there will be some arguments of people, for instance, about um, I have the domain knowledge, so I'm the only one who's able to mm -hmm. classify certain questions at a specific level of 
knowledge, wisdom, intelligence. So um, when I have an interview, a user research interview, um, and I go through the transcript, because of my years of experience in this domain, I will be able to tell you what's relevant and what isn't. Mm -hmm. So how like can we let this, can we trust AI? Can we trust large language models with these tasks? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's really a, take it with a grain of salt of, you don't have to let the language models provide the final answer. And it's kind of like building a house. Like you don't have to have, I mean, some, I don't know, some machine putting up the walls and putting in the floor, but maybe you have something there to help you measure or to, I mean, figure out how to lay out a room. I mean, it can just be a tool um, that can augment our ability to do our jobs. And, and I think that's where I take more of a positive approach of, I think it, I mean, there are going to be jobs that maybe it can do everything, soup to nuts. But in a lot of jobs, it's really just an accelerant. And it could be something like help me consume information. I mean, people talk about information overload. How can I let, just let it summarize things? And then I can go read what it thinks might be important. So I, I think there's so many use cases that, I mean, it doesn't have to be the like, hey, AI is taking over a solution, but it's just, it's it's helping. And um, going back to uh, the podcast example or the workshop recording mm -hmm. example, you can just ask the question, like list out all the, well, questions that were asked or mm -hmm. uh, what were the questions and answers, right? You don't, you yeah. can ask it for more, uh, let's call it granular data. You don't have to yeah. ask it to come up with insights, right? It can help you, like yeah. you said, summarize. Um, in this workshop, people ask these 10 questions and then it's up to you to make sense whether or not or which of these questions is relevant, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to let it make decisions for you. You can let it, you can, I mean, summarization is such a great use case for it where I, I mean, I have something where it's um, watching my email and my Slack messages, and then every morning can send me a summary of follow-ups. Say, here's the interesting, here's the things that we think are interesting, and here's what we think, I mean, you might want to follow up on. And it's, I mean, it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, that just saved me a couple minutes. I don't have to actually, I mean, first thing, read through everything. Maybe these are the top five things I should look at. But it's not like deleting the email so I never see them before. I mean, I see them again. Um, it's just augmenting to, to help save time. And and I think, I mean, the time savings is really the key in, in a lot of these domains. Well, and it allows you to process um, larger volumes of data. Uh, I, I think it's the number one value, honestly. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh, again, I have 70 recordings and our archive is just growing. Um, mm -hmm. I've moved beyond the point where somebody can ask me a question and tell uh, and ask like, "Hey, Mark, in which sessions do we talk about change management?" And I, uh, like, I remember the last five sessions, but I don't remember what we discussed three years ago. So that's like, yeah. that's a that's a severe and real limitation of having a physical librarian here. Well, and it's it's even a step beyond search. I mean, search is still such an unsolved problem, even in your local files, or I mean, even in in things you remember. I mean, I'm always saving off links to articles or YouTube videos and things like that. And I mean, the ability to just be like, "Hey, what was that video like from a couple of weeks ago that was about blah blah blah?" and it could find it. I mean, that kind of stuff is. I mean, I would probably waste a half an hour like scrolling back through Slack trying to find that video. And and those are the kind of things that, I mean, each one of those little time savings adds up. And and it's, a I mean, a ton of data that you can process. So There was, um, you were at a Microsoft event recently, and I think they, show, I, yeah. I don't remember what they called it, but they will be basically recording everything you do in Windows and allow you to search through your history in a, Cement yeah, way, it's called, right? It's it's called uh, called recall. Exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting one. I mean, I've it's funny because as I'm very AI positive and in these talking about these other things, um, I'm a little more skeptical on that one. Um, I don't see the value of it necessarily from a like from the way they're they're kind of talking about it right now, um, but. It's it's something that it's had such a backlash from um, from people being I mean very skeptical about it from a security standpoint um, like are they redacting the data and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about that as well because okay 
so we have this um we have this open space and let's call it our library our corporate library and we've made it very easy for ourselves to start adding books to the library um what about um concerns around privacy right mm -hmm. uh, who gets to decide uh what gets uh indexed in in our library what do you see what, what's the conversation that's happening around the topic of privacy yeah i mean the thing we hear it's there's kind of two two camps the the smaller businesses startups um, personal projects they are looking more for velocity they're they're willing to like just put the data in get the value they're not super worried if i mean i don't know some slack message gets out into the wild um the bigger businesses like especially in healthcare and fintech and these ones i've heard that they're very concerned and they want the value um, but what they're asking for is can we have our own private version of it like we don't want to share our database with other customers that kind of thing so i think i think it kind of falls into those two camps well we might be getting a little bit technical here but right now we see the option of okay you have your own library and i ask the librarian to retreat to to come up with data from our library and then mm -hmm. it usually needs to send this data to a server of chat gpt or google gemini or whatever but at the yeah. same time we're seeing uh, the rise of local large language mm -hmm. models like Olama from Facebook, I think, where you can actually have like sitting um, a large language model next to the librarian <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. within within your building and not having to send the data over to one of these corporates, right? And I think that's where it gets interesting where, it, and it's a balance. I mean, if you're doing RAG and you're providing a lot of the context to the model, you need a model that, has a conversational ability and somewhat of a cognitive ability or reason, somewhat of reasoning ability, you maybe don't care about the data it was trained on as much. Like you're not going to ask it a question about Shakespeare. You really just want to have it process your data and give it back to you in something in a way to, to make sense. So I'll be really curious to see how models progress over the next year or so, because I mean, a lot of the work we're doing, I mean, even with using GPT-4 for like data extraction and, and those kind of things, um, we're not taking advantage of the data that it was trained on necessarily. I mean, we're not asking it to retrieve back that data. We're just trying to have a better a better brain, a better smart um, of how it answers. Yeah, well, that's I, I never realized that. What, what would this mean or what could this mean uh, for large language models? They, they just need to understand language? instead of having access to data and, and maybe i mean that's that might be the thing and i'm and that's where i'm kind of talking past my expertise but i think the the ability to process language and to reason and those kind of things more than giving me an answer about a health problem or about a i mean a movie that it might be trained on like i don't typically ever care about that those kind of answers i'm giving it a piece of data um some text or something and asking it to process what the input i'm giving it and and that's where i um, i'll be interested to see like maybe there'll be models tuned for that use case versus ones that are more i mean that you're actually like i don't know like a student would want to learn have, and care more about the training data than maybe a use case of just summarization yeah exactly so in our case uh we're interested in give us um, the information that has been shared in our workshops about change management versus please explain change management to me. Right? Exactly. That's, a, that's, exactly. that's a significantly different question and uh, you, need yep. diff you can use different large language models for that. Yeah, I mean, the example would be is, I mean, I'm an expert in the field and I'm gonna give you an answer based on my expertise versus somebody that's just intelligent and can hear what you're saying, digest it, and spit back some answer that makes sense. And they maybe don't know anything about that domain. Mm -hmm. And and um, so I think it. I mean, I'm sure people are kind of working on maybe those. I mean, di sort of divergent concepts of models. But uh, like like you said, for local models, I could see that it becomes more like a coprocessor at that point, where it's just really processing language like a person would, and and can reason and answer like that. It's an interpreter. Right, it, it yeah. becomes an interpreter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. So, so 
we mentioned uh, already a few, but what are what what are the big limitations that are still out there that maybe haven't been solved around uh, RAG? I mean, the, the retrieval we talked a lot about, I think there's still so many methods of retrieval to just get the right data to the model. And I think that's where um, we touched a little bit on knowledge graphs and, and different things, but the there's just so many techniques that, that can be done uh, to get the right data in there. And then on the generation side, I think the the um, latency of that is really a big thing of how long does it take to get the answers back how long um we talk about contact with context windows of like how much data can i throw at the model and and all of those are, are changing i mean every month really mm -hmm. you mentioned something that i realized i also wanted to pick your brain about uh, and we haven't yeah. done yet is the uh, notion of graphs uh, because yeah. that's uh, a key principle in this whole thing and your company is even called Gravlet, so <laughs> apparently this must yeah. be important. Um, please explain the, the concept of graphs to us and why is it such a key concept? Yeah, I mean, if you think about, I mean, things that we deal with on a daily basis, I mean, the kind of people, places, things, and their relationships. I mean, like, I'm a person, I live in Seattle, my company is Graphlet, they're interconnections, sort of threads between those, and, and we call those types of um things we, we call them entities and you have relationships between entities in that graph and and what it is is i mean as you build up these relationships and you kind of remember more data like as more books get added to the library more relationships can be created uh, between topics and people and and all this um but there's also a structure that you're creating because uh, because you're identifying a word as having a classification, like, oh, this is Graphlet the company, not Graphlet the whatever book. I mean, and that is a, a really important thing for these large language models to understand that sort of taxonomy and classification of the data. And so graphs provide another organization method. Um, in addition to the sort of text similarity, you now get all the relationships between the, um, the material. And, and that's what we're really all trying to work on is kind of combining those two. So you're not just searching by similar text and you're not just searching by, hey, Microsoft was mentioned in this book. It's really kind of combining those to get better retrieval for the models. People might be familiar with graphs when they think about social networks and they see like friends yeah. of friends and where yeah. do you work? What's, uh, do you have any pets? Stuff like that. Um, what opportunities does uh, using and thinking in graphs uh, graph opens? I mean, we sort of see there's two sides to it. You can use it as a filtering method. So when you ask a question to the large language model, it may not just be looking for similar text, but what you do is you do a first pass and you identify the people, places, and things in the prompt. So it's like, oh, okay, here's Kirk as a person, here's... Um, I mean, Microsoft is a company, and the interesting thing is because of the context of the conversation, even though the, the word just says Kirk, it will know, oh, okay, here's who's really speaking. Here's the, here's the person. Like, I, I get a pointer to me, not just a word. And that's the big difference is it could reference, you could say, the company, in, the large company in Redmond. And it would identify that as Microsoft. And so that's where the text similarity may not find that, but the tech, the, the extraction of the entity could find it. Right. And so by combining that, you get a much more accurate filter. Um, and then the flip side of that is, as you say you go, I mean, you go to the library, pick a couple books to ask questions about, and you identify all the people, places, and things mentioned in those books. And what you can do is, if you get the descriptions of all that, and you provide not just the text of the book, but maybe like the Wikipedia description of those people and places, and add that to your context, the LLM can answer a lot more accurately. And, and we've seen, I mean, really some interesting cases where just by adding in that kind of color around the, the, the text, um, even just with Wikipedia descriptions, it answers with much more thought, kind of thoughtfulness. And 
it seems more personalized in a way where it just seems to know more about the entities that you're asking about. And it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's more of an art than a science, but I think it, it just provides a little more color in how it can answer the questions. What makes you say that it's more of an art than a science? I mean, all of this, I think AI to me is more of an art than a science. It's because it's not, um, I mean, you can ask it a question two days in a row and it gives you a different answer. Like it's, it's not the kind of thing where one plus one equals two. I mean, it's, it's not like that where it's a, you really, I think with AI, you got to get your head around that you're kind of molding it and guiding it almost like a child. You're not like, <laughs> you're not just like plugging something into it, like into a plug in a socket. And, um, and I, I think it's, it's good and bad. I mean, to me that is more artistic in a way and it you kind of sculpt the answers that you're getting rather than just like typical computers that you give an answer and you get the same answer back every day and it's fascinating that uh in that sense we talk about prompt engineering it, yeah it should have been prompt sculpting uh, according to it's, you I, it's it's funny i've i never even thought of that before but that's actually like a really good yeah i i totally would agree with that yeah mm. and uh coming back to your example of graphs um the use case that was going through my mind is, let's say you presented at a conference, uh, UXConf 2022 in Austin, um, yep. and we might have a transcript of that presentation. So we feed that into our library, you put it in a book, and now when we go for retrieval, you might not even have mentioned the conference or your name in the transcript, mm -hmm. but using a graph, we can actually ask, like, what were the key highlights of Kirk's presentation at UXConf 2020, and we'll know mm -hmm. that we're talking about person Kirk. We know we're talking about UXConf in, in Austin, mm -hmm. um, or or we could even like uh, what did the CEO of Graphlet talk about yeah. at the UX uh, right? And then it's able to combine all these uh, like you said entities and uh, filter the search, even yeah. though that data might not be embedded in the actual data. It's data about the data, uh, data the metadata. Um, is that it's, correct? Yeah, it's 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 like the indirect. It's like it's second order effects of um, it, and this is I think where the graph really helps. Is exactly like you said. I mean, you can make a reference to something that isn't explicit, and in the first pass, if you can ex if you can convert that implicit thing into an explicit thing, then you can search on it. And I think what happens is if it, if you like if it just says hey that guy in Seattle, <laughs> like it, they wouldn't know, but if you knew that it was like, oh, that guy in Seattle that that spoke at that conference in Austin, it could put the pieces together, mm -hmm. and and that's really where I think that's where it gets super interesting. And and I think we're and like I said, I mean, we're just scratching the surface of these things, but I think that that becomes more of a multi-step process, mm -hmm. um, which some people are calling kind of agents, where it's like, okay, you do a first pass. You process the data, you get an answer, you use that to explore even further and explore further, and then finally get your answer a couple steps down the road. Uh, let's talk about agents in a second. Uh, one thing that was going through my mind in this graph example is uh, in a service design context, you want to analyze results. And uh, typically, we don't use demographics to label and filter stuff, but I can imagine uh, we could have uh, an example where we say, okay, so we've done 20 user research interviews. Give me um, the insights uh, of the interviews where we spoke to uh, people within a certain age group or mm -hmm. a different kind of demographic. Like, again, usually we don't do that. So I'm, I'm going to guess that we can also use more qualitative uh, features of people. Um, mm -hmm. But that would also be a filter, right? You can you can you can yeah. add the, uh, age as uh, a metadata to the to the entity person, and then you can use yeah. that to filter. Well, right, exactly, and that's where it gets really interesting. And I think that's where the more the more work you do up front to provide context or that metadata, the better of an experience you get downstream. And so that's why when we first started the company, we focused a lot on capturing everything. Like if we got an image off of a drone, we stored what lens it used mm -hmm. and what f-stop it used. And it was like, I wasn't really sure if we'd ever use it, but I wanted to make sure we had the fidelity of the data. And I think it's a little bit different where there's other worlds where they're like, ah, well, if you don't need it, don't keep it. But this is more of an archival mm. approach 
that it's like, okay, well, let's just make sure we keep the fidelity of what we, what we could need in the future. Yeah. And again, and not, uh, the examples are just popping up in my head. I can imagine asking, you know, we've done a bunch of internal workshops with internal stakeholders, uh, asking a question like, what's the sentiment of the marketing department uh, on the project that we're currently working on? Mm -hmm. so, Right. So you've had multiple stakeholders, you've engaged them in workshops, you've recorded these workshops, and then you're able to label who said what, like maybe I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe we're not there yet, but that could be a very valid uh, use case. It, it, the way you have to think about it is like, how would a human answer that? And you think of like, okay, if you had a, a research intern, what steps would they take? You have to break down the question into multiple steps. And se sentiment is kind of the final step. That's like the summarization of it. But first, you have to break it down and go, okay, like I'm going to I'm going to find my like my first set of data and then I'm going to subset that maybe with a second phrase that you gave it and then finally I'm going to get the sentiment of what's left. And I think that's what what people call naive rag, just the simple question and answer cannot do at all. Mm -hmm. Like it's just not it's not good at that. Um, but this kind of multi-step, more agent model or whatever you want to call it, that's that like, okay, get the haystack, get a smaller haystack, get a smaller haystack, and then finally process the data at the end. Take us into the world of agents. Uh, what do we need to know about agents at the moment? It's in flux. <laughs> that's the biggest thing. I mean, I think there's a couple, it, it, it circled back to from, I mean, they've been around forever. I mean, if you think of autonomous processing it's essentially programs that are sitting there running in the background like you could call it a cron job you can call it i mean whatever but i mean it's they, these kind of things have been around and they're doing multiple steps of processing which could be on a timer it could be triggered um and it could also be things like um, we call workflows, like a directed acyclic graph, a DAG, that a lot of data workflows follow. That is simply think of it as a flowchart. And really, that's mostly what a lot of the agent concepts are. They're a framework to run code and take the output of one step and put it into the input of another step. And I mean, basic programming and get something out at the end of the day. And one of the things I think we're seeing now is there's more AI and LLM specific agent libraries, but they're very similar to what I've seen from kind of agents in the past that had nothing to do with AI. And so I think we'll see how this progresses in the future. And the way we're looking at it is agents are kind of a layer that uh, like a Zapier or something like that, that you can program to and like, I mean, have sort of that workflow and you just happen to call out to something that does rag. It's just an API. And that's kind of the way we're looking at it is you could layer an agent something on top of us rather than us being embedded into agents directly. Um, but other people are taking a much more integrated approach. And so you could you get it on both sides. So um, again, the question here, what do agents enable that's currently maybe hard to do? I mean, what's hard to do? I mean, it's, it's, auto, it's all about automation. And so I think there's a lot of overlap with um, like RPA and different things like that for kind of um, automating a lot of workflows. What is and, RPA? Oh man, I, you put me on the spot now. It's I always think of it as it's like automating UIs, and so you're you're automating like point and click and um, of of sort of human directed um, programming interfaces. Um, but the, I mean, a lot of that is very similar to, I mean, kind of agent concepts where they're self-driven and, and kind of going and doing things for you. Um, but I think, I mean, the, the value there is, is really at the heart. It's, it's automating something that a human could do. Is, is, um, is a good way to, th or an example, uh, to think about agents, um, in a way where we mentioned the librarian a lot of the times, uh, as a entity, yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. To also uh, identify maybe a researcher as an entity yeah. and, and say that, okay, that's my other entity. Uh, and this is maybe the most simple example, but having these two agents, entities interact with each other. So the researcher yeah. is asking the librarian something, librarian comes back with some data, and then the researcher judges mm -hmm. whether or not that's enough information for them to take the next step. Right. Yeah. Is, is, is that sort of the mental Very model much, people yeah. use for agents? And you, and you can see like there's um, some have talked to like you have an, a researcher, you have an editor, you have a publisher. And I think in a, in a linear step, 
it's not that complicated, but it's like what you were saying is if they loop back on these on themselves and say, oh, somebody can reject the flow to the next stage and pump, bump it back to the front. And I mean, but that concept doesn't really have anything to do with AI. Mm -hmm. That's really just more of a programming work, like a workflow, um, a data flow. And so I think that's why, like, I mean, there, those kind of things have been around for years of, of those kind of systems, but conceptually you're hundred percent right on is evaluate the output of this one stage, decide if you want to go to the next stage. Well, the, the difference here when you start plugging in large language models uh, is that the large language model is able to make a judgment call whether or not, for instance, the quality of the data yeah. is at the level that it needs to take the next step. Or like the librarian mm -hmm. comes back with some uh, Excel sheet type data, uh, columns and rows, mm -hmm. and then the researcher need, knows, hey, I need to call in the data scientist agent to yeah. process this. Right, that's that's sort of the intelligence yep. that makes this. You don't have to uh, program in the flow. You just have to exactly. allow access to certain entities, certain ex uh, expertise, and then mm -hmm. they will mm -hmm. figure it out on their own. Something like that, right? I think you're right. I mean, I think there was classic kind of data science where you could do that in a statistical way and say, okay, we're we have a confidence level. A lot of times, it would work on that of does it go to the next stage, and now it's more. I mean, more language and human-like where it's like, hey, go look at a bunch of text and decide what you want to do next. And and I think, I mean, it, that's where it gets more fluid and, and more dynamic. I'm really curious. Um, you are very much embedded in this whole world of AI, large language models, AIs, uh, graphs. Um, what's, uh, for the amount that you can and are willing to share, what's on your roadmap what will you mm -hmm. what do you want to work on for the next year yeah i mean the the rest of this year i think is is really dealing with the larger kind of data sets and the and the things that come along with it like security scalability performance um kind of just scaling out what we've already done from a from an operational standpoint um really with the product from a technology side I think we're just, I mean, there's the graph, I think um, really the whole thing we were talking about with, um, what do you talk, uh, prompt um, classification, kind of the, the like the query, like text to query. Um, there's there's a lot of gaps in what we already have that I would like to fill in, in that whole world. And just leveraging the graph more to give better better responses. And then really this whole agent idea is, Kind of watching what people need and really seeing okay how far do we lean into that um do we integrate or do we innovate really in in that space but just kind of keeping or like building building layers on top of the foundation if our listeners uh got curious and maybe even excited to start playing around with this stuff do you have some practical tips for us yeah, I mean, there's there's so many great demo apps out there and and tools and, and open source projects and things like that. I mean, we you can really pick one side or the other. You can kind of do it yourself and want to get into the weeds with putting all the pieces together and writing a lot of code. And we kind of go a little more on the kind of more no-code, low-code world where, look, it's one API, you put in some data, you can chat with an L, like an LLM. And I think really for, for different people, different use cases, um, I mean, I think we, there's now the capability to pick either direction and people can explore and, um, and kind of really understand why are LLMs different and why is this not just classic programming? And, mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's what gets, I mean, gets so interesting and, and honestly, just don't be scared of it because it's, it's really just a tool. And I mean, tools can be used for good or bad, but it's uh, it's and, and it's changing so quickly. Honestly, is really the other thing that even if even if something's not working today, next week, next month, it's going to be completely different or or better. I mean, the um, thanks for sharing and uh, adding to this. Uh, quite recently, OpenAI and uh, Gemini have added the ability to uh, OpenAI calls it. Assistance and Gemini just allows you to upload files to their mm -hmm. prompts. That's like the most, if you want to get a first sense of what this retrieval augmented generation looks like, I mm -hmm. would say that's start there. Like they yeah. take a video, take a podcast, take a transcript, add it to 
open AI to ChatGPT or to add it to Gemini. And you can actually start asking questions about yeah. the file or the transcript that you've uploaded. And then at some point, and that was where you and I got in touch, I was like, mm -hmm. okay, this is great, but how many files can I upload, right? Can I upload mm -hmm. 70 sessions? Uh, no, right. I can't. So then you then a need for more robust and more flexible system uh, arises, but you don't have to start there. You can very easily uh, start exploring the power of this concept using existing tools, right? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, and and even like you said before, is there you have the option of local models now. I mean, local LLMs versus, um, I mean, because cost becomes a factor. I mean, we've have had people. I mean, if you kind of blindly upload a bunch of data and start, I mean, doing a bunch of stuff, it's easy to, I mean, run up costs on OpenAI if you're not careful, just like any any other service. And I think having the ability to say, look, I mean. All I need is a GPU on my system and my local system. And I know that I'm not going to spend like a zillion dollars beyond that um, if I'm just playing around. So I think it's it's like anything. I mean, we like it's no different than long distance costs in the old days where if you weren't careful, you could run up a lot of money. And it's just it's it's a tool that you have to know how to use a little bit um, once you really get into the, the real heavy usage areas. What places would you direct people to who want to learn more. I know you've shared recently a quite exhaustive article around graphs. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else that you feel might be a good starting point here? Yeah, I mean, there's there's some really good, um, there's a like the MLOps community um, has a good uh, community site of blogs and, and videos. Um, I, I watch a lot of, li and listen to a lot of podcasts in this space. Um, I think, I mean, there's there's a bunch of open source projects that I think are people get familiar with um, that have a lot of good content. Um, and I think that, I mean, the YouTube has a ton. I mean, just searching for, I mean, LMs and, and RAG on YouTube, there's a, I mean, an immense amount of content um, just to get started with from, from all different vendors and open source projects and and things like that and um and also yeah i mean just if uh i mean discords honestly are are really useful where a lot of the good conversations and i, I mean that's how I, when we originally spoke is there's there's a lot of great communities of people just trying to learn um all of uh, all these different techniques and, and things kirk uh thanks so much for coming on the show as a sort of an outside yeah, not sort of an outside guest or uh, from the yeah service design space i think it's so interesting to make these crossovers um and this is really a, a technique a tool a method where i see so much uh, opportunity for our community um so uh yeah again uh, thanks for coming on and and shining a light on the black box of ai and opening it uh, a little bit for us no, so happy to be here. And I think, I mean, knowledge management applies to so many domains. And I think it's it's an interesting area um, for service design as well to, to apply all this to. So. Well, it's clear that AI is a fascinating and rapidly evolving field. It can be a bit intimidating, but I'm personally more excited than concerned as long as we remember that it's a tool to assist us, not to replace us. I'm already imagining being able to instantly access any conversation we've had in the Circle community. That's going to be an invaluable resource for our members. So as we wrap up, I'd love to hear your thoughts. How do you envision using AI in your own work? What opportunities and challenges do you anticipate? If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.